And I'm going to read in the time here just verses 16 and 17. And this is coming from the uh, New International Version. This is what the Lord says, Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. It is a delight for me to be able to be here this morning. But I think if I could read your minds, you're probably thinking this is the last person in the world you expect to see up here. Uh, but it is a delight for me to be here again. And I think that one of the things I wanted to talk about this morning is going to be with the, some of the struggles that Israel had gone through in the past and the hope that God gave to them for the future. Just as uh, many of you and are struggling through some hard times now with this pandemic, uh, but the message is that God's got a plan for us and it's going to be for our good and things are going to get better. Uh, as I think about this Maybe two weeks ago, I was listening to the Rick and Bubba show. And, and let me assure you, I do not get my theology from them. But uh, there, there's a lot of things that I enjoy about the show. I get a good laugh from it. And uh, they have one uh, gentleman by the name of Gary. They call him Gary the Bulldozer. He, he works some with Rick down on his farm. And uh, they were talking one day, and he kept talking about this pandemic that's going on. And they, they tried to correct him. He said, it's not a pandemic, Gary. It, it's a pandemic. But he kept on, and every time he talked, he called it a pandemic. And each time they correct him, it's a pandemic that's going on. And finally, he said, "Well, I said, I, I, he said, I don't know. He said, it just I thought they were calling it a pandemic because so many people's plans have been curtailed." And and I thought, well, that's that's pretty good. It has. There's so many people. Uh, it's happened to individuals. It's happened to businesses. It's happened to the church, and it's happened to nations that have had plans and things that had to be changed and because of this pandemic that we're going through. And I thought about, you know, how, how difficult that's made it for a lot of people. I think especially about those who, who had businesses that had to shut down. And especially, I, I think about those who are trying to run a restaurant. That's one of the most difficult businesses to run and make a success. I remember there in Roebuck, going to church there at Roebuck, uh, we passed this little restaurant uh, every Sunday going to church. And during our time, I think there were five different restaurants in that building. They just couldn't make it. They would last for about a year and a half or two maybe. And then they'd close. And a little while later, another restaurant would begin there. They just couldn't make a success of it. And one of the things they talked about, and even when they were able to open up again with this pandemic, open up the restaurants, that many times they have so many things that they have to go through. Maybe they're limited to no more than 50% occupancy. And, and, and I've heard them people say, listen, it, it's hard to make a, a success out of a restaurant. And when they cut back to 50% of the people you can have in there, it really makes it difficult. And so there are some businesses, I'm sure, that, that have to close it that may never open up again. And so it, it's a lot of problems for people. Uh, there have been problems here for the church as we think about that today, we're, we're not able to have everybody together at one time because when we come, we've got to make sure that we're wearing masks and we've got to keep that distance between each other, between families of at least six feet uh, to try to prevent the spread of this uh, pandemic among God's people here. And so we want to do that to, to help, but it makes it difficult. And a lot of times in regard to that, and I think about some of the things that the church here has had to postpone because of that. Uh, we had to postpone Mission Sunday. But boy, didn't that turn out good. Because we had one of the greatest gifts ever uh, on the Mission Sunday when we had it. But there are other things that not only had to be postponed, eventually had to be canceled for this year. Our mission trip to Belize. We've been going down to Belize for 50 years plus, but now all of a sudden, because of this, we were not able to go. And hopefully, uh, next spring, uh, 2021, we'll be able to have this pandemic out of the way where we will be able to go and resume the work that we've been doing down there and so many things that, that need to be done, but we simply cannot do because of this. And it may be hard to believe, but I know some, some retirements have been influenced by that too. I say that as a joke. It's, Richard's not with us because 
one of his sons that played football was exposed to their coach and had uh, a positive uh, for the COVID-19. And so now Richard and his family uh, have to be in quarantine. Uh, I, I think maybe it's just about a, a week or a little more to go for them on that, but he was not able to be here today. And that's why I'm here to speak to you. And so I want us to look at this example we have from the pen of Jeremiah about the things that, that was happening to them. Jeremiah had been called by God to be a prophet. And it was at a time when the nation of Israel has been divided. It's been divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. But not only that, it's also a time when the northern kingdom of Israel has been conquered by Assyria. And that's because of the fact that they had failed to live up to God's standard that He had for them. The Bible shows us there that the northern kingdom was guilty of fearing other gods and walking in the customs of the nations that God had cast out of the land before Israel came. You know, God had promised that land to uh, Abraham hundreds of years before, but it's not yet been given to them. They had not possessed it until the time came when the nations that were dwelling in that land of Palestine had reached that point where God said, enough is enough, and He's going to put them out. And so He allows Israel to come in and take that land. And now Israel itself has become guilty of the same sins as those nations that God has kicked out. And so that's why Israel is allowed to be conquered by Assyria and carried away. Now when Jer Jeremiah became the prophet for God there, it was around 627 B.C. And this was a time when there were about three nations that were vying for supremacy. There was the nation of Babylon, the nation of Assyria, and the nation of Egypt. But in time, what happened was that Babylon was able to crush Assyria and take control of it. And then in 627 BC, or excuse me, 605 BC, the Battle of Carchemish, uh, Babylon was able to conquer Egypt. So now they're the ruling nation, and Judah is left alone. That's the southern kingdom of the tribes of Benjamin uh, and uh, Judah, and they're the only ones left faithful to God. But as one person said in regard to this time, Judah stood alone, caught between the upper and the lower millstone. Uh, you think about those millstones that are used to crush out the, the seed and separate it from the chaff. Well, Judah has found themselves in that situation between the upper and lower millstone. That is, they are being surrounded by this nation of Babylon, and in time they themselves are going to be crushed, and they'll be carried away into captivity. And so things are not going the way that, that God's people had hoped it would go, and certainly not the way that Jeremiah was looking for it to go. He found himself in a difficult situation. He's given a message from God to preach to his people, and that message had concluded in the beginning that Judah is going to be conquered by Babylon, and they're going to be carried away into captivity. And when the people heard that message, they didn't like that, and they began uh, saying of this man Jeremiah that he was a traitor to his country. And they were not willing to listen to what he had to say. And Jeremiah admitted the fact that as he preached that message of God, that he was being ridiculed constantly by his own people. But there were those, among others, of the prophets, the false prophets, who did not agree with what Jeremiah was preaching. And they tried to bring political pressure upon him to get him to cease the preaching that he was doing. And it nearly worked. In fact, it had gotten to the point that Jeremiah decided he was leaving the ministry. He was going to get pre quit preaching that message that God had given him because of all the abuse it was bringing upon him. And he was ready to get out of it. But then he realized, because of his love for God, which was superior for his love for his own people, and because of the responsibility that he had to God, he couldn't do it. He said in Jeremiah 20 and verse 9 that the message that God had given him was, quote, like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. And so Jeremiah goes back to preaching the message that God's given. But now as he goes back, it's not only that message of destruction that's coming from Babylon, and it's not just that message you're going to be carried away into captivity, but he also begins to a message from God for his people. A message, really a message of hope. The text tells us in Jeremiah 29 
in verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. It's going to be hard for Judah. It's going to be hard for Jeremiah. A lot of difficulties you're going to have to go through. And that captivity is going to last for 70 years. Now, some of these false prophets are saying, no, 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 it won't be that long. Only be two years and we'll be able to go back. But Jeremiah insists it's 70 years. And so his message to the people of Judah is, you need to accept this, go into that captivity, settle yourselves there, and raise a family. Give your daughters in marriage and find women to give your sons to in marriage. And so you raise that family and accept the fact you're going to be there for 70 years before you'll be able to come back. But to help them to do that, He gives them this encouragement from God. And I love this because I think the encouragement that He's given to His people then is the same kind of encouragement God gives to His people today. So let's look at what He says through Jeremiah. There in verse 16 especially, Thus says the Lord, Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. Now, to understand this, we have to look at that verse in context here. The verse right before that, I didn't read that previously, but verse 15, I didn't read it because it's a verse we're all familiar with anyway. But in verse 15, it says, Thus says the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they were no more. Now we're familiar because of that verse because in the New Testament, Matthew takes that verse and Matthew says this verse finds its fulfillment in the killing of the innocents. When Herod heard that one had been born to be king of the Jews, he sought out to destroy that king. And so learning from the wise men about what time this had occurred that they saw the star announcing this and learning from the priest where that child was to be born. He then sent people down to Bethlehem with the command there to kill all the male children from the age of two years and under. And Matthew says, that's why we find here Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they were not. But in the context here of Jeremiah, it had its first fulfillment in the carrying away of Judah into Babylonian captivity. Because those women are weeping and they cannot be comforted because their children have been taken from them. They are not. Now it may be when it says they're weeping because their children are not that they understand that their children are going to be killed and, and many of them were. But it had primarily reference to those children that are taken from them and taken into Babylonian captivity, where they're going to be serving the king of Babylon. And so they're taken away from their parents. And those mothers do not see those children. And that's why they're weeping, because their children are no more, that is, no more with them. And so the message that God gives to them is to refrain your face from weeping and your eyes from tears. Why? Because, he says, your children that have been taken from you are going to be brought back. It's just not going to be quickly. It's going to be 70 years that they'll be in captivity before they will be brought back to their own land there. That they'll be brought home from the land of the enemies and to be back then among their own people. And so the message of God to these women is to moderate your sorrow. Keep back your face from weeping and your eyes from tears. Why? Because your children are going to come back from the land of the enemy. And later, in verse 17, he tells us when those children come back, they'll be coming back to their own land. It's not just they're going to be freed from captivity, but they're coming back to their land, back to the land of Palestine, to live there once again and to serve God. That was God's hope for them. He's given them a message of hope for the end. Any time that we're in a situation where things are going bad for us, when, when we're having difficulties with things in life, it's good to know that God's message to us is, listen, there's a hope for the end.
And it may be that two things are involved in that. Hope for the end because the end of all those things you're suffering is coming. And it's going to be brought to an end. But to realize also that in the end come all the rewards. There will be a reward given to you. That's the promise of God to His people there. But the fact of the matter is that's also the promise of God to us today. That's the hope that we have from God. And so in order for us to be able to repress that sorrow that we're feeling today, some of our congregation have lost loved ones. There's tremendous sorrow in that. Some have lost jobs. Some have found, found it difficult where they're not able to get out and even come to worship. And they're having to worship if they can, uh, watching the services on YouTube. And some can't even do that. But there's going to be an end to this. And people will be able to come back and be able to serve God again. And in order to support us under the times of trouble that we have, we have a reason to hope that everything is going to end well. As I think about that, I think about it in the New Testament, the situation uh, that's given to us there in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 15. This is a time when Jesus and His disciples and, and some others are traveling with Him have come to the city of Nain. Yeah, well, it's not really a city. It's just a little town. And as they come there, there is a funeral, funeral procession coming out of that city. A young man has died. And following behind is his widowed mother, and other family members and friends. And Jesus comes up and He stops the procession. And He turns and He speaks to this mother. And what Jesus says to her, if any other, anybody else had said that, it would have been, indeed been something that was considered a callous thing. Because Jesus looks at this woman and in the modern translation He says to her, quit crying. Here is a woman who is a widow. We don't know how long she's been a widow, but sometime before this, her husband had died. And, and this son of hers has now reached that age where he's going to be able to help take care of his mother. He can be the leader of that family and provide for her. But just as he's reached that age, his life is taken. And he is her only son. When the Bible wants to emphasize great sorrow, it says it's a sorrow like the death of an only son. When that only son has died, that ends the family. There are no more descendants that go on. And to the Israelites, that was a tremendous burden. And this woman is under tremendous sorrow because she's lost her husband and now she's lost her only son and she's mourning. And Jesus turns to her and said, quit crying. But Jesus could do that because Jesus knows the reward for His people. And He knows He has the solution to the sorrow that she suffered. And after speaking to her and saying, quit crying, He then turns to the young man who's laying there in his coffin and Jesus says to him, young man, get up. And He arose. And Jesus presents him back to His mother. Now her reason for crying is removed. She's no longer that sorrow. It may be she'll still be crying tears, but they're tears of joy because of what's been provided. And that's what God wants us to know as His people. There is hope for our end. There is a reward that God has for His people. And there will be a time when His people will come back. And we need to understand that. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, and verse 18, the Apostle Paul, who had suffered so much in this life and his service to God and Christ, he said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I know what it's like when people go through sorrow. We've all do. We've all gone through those times. But the time's coming. If you're a faithful child of God, the time's coming. You're going to look back on that and you're going to say, why was I so upset? Why was I so worried? Why was I so bothered by that? As I look now at the glory I have from God because of my life for Him. And so that sorrow is removed because there is hope there in the end. And there is hope today for those of us who are God's children. 
To Israel of old, God had said, you'd stop your weeping because your children are going to come back from the land of enemy and they're coming back to their own land. For us today in our times of sorrow, God wants us to know and understand. You know, refrain from weeping. Keep your eyes from tears because the time's coming when you're going to be brought back from the land of enemy. Uh, here you're going to be brought back from the dead. You know, there's that promise. All of us are going to die, but there's that hope that we will be brought back from the dead. In the book of John, in chapter 5, and verse 28 and 29, we're told, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all they that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of condemnation. There's no reason for us to sorrow and to weep because we know the time's coming when we will. Even though we die physically, we're going to be raised up again. And we can know that God's going to do that because we've already experienced a resurrection to life. We who were dead in our sins and trespasses, God has made us alive again. That's Paul's message to the church there at Ephesus in chapter 2 and verse 1. And you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. You were dead in sins at one time. All of us were. But when you became a child of God, we were made to be alive again, spiritually. And so that's evidence to us that just as God made us alive again spiritually, He can also make us alive again physically. We don't need to worry about that. And the children will come back to their own country. But our own country isn't here in the United States. Our own country is in heaven. I think about those patriarchs of old who the Bible tells us if they had given consideration to that land that they had left, they had time and opportunity to go back to that land. But now, Hebrews eleven sixteen. but now they desire a better. That is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. We're going to come back to our own country. And our own country is not here in the United States, but it's in heaven. I love that song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. We will be brought back to our own country. And so there's reasons, even in times of pandemics, even in times when, when our plans are, are being destroyed sometimes and we're not able to do the things we used to do, there's a hope that we have from God that all of that will be changed. There is a reward we'll receive. We'll come back from the land of the enemy. And we've done that since we've been turned from service to Satan to serving God. And someday we'll come back to our own land. To our land we have with God in heaven. But now here's the thing about it. The promises and plans of God that cannot be destroyed, no pandemic, no power can destroy that. And yet the promises of God and His plans for us are for us only. We do three things. And this is the close of our lesson. Number one, we need to be people who will listen to God. In fact, Jesus said of that in John chapter 10, and verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. Are you listening to God? Are you listening to what Jesus has to say to you? We've got to do that. We've got to spend time with God's Word studying and listening to what He has to say to us. Oh, but it's much more than that. We not only need to listen to the voice of God, we need to obey the voice of God. James talks about this in James chapter 1 and verse 22 when he said, Be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. It's not sufficient just to listen to God's Word. We need to do that. But listening to God's Word, we need to obey God's Word. That means, among other things, for those who are outside of Christ, they've got to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. They've got to repent of their sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. They've got to confess their faith in Christ, Matthew 10, 32. And they have got to be buried with Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of their sins, 
Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. But then there's the third thing. Not only must we listen to the voice of God, and we need to obey the voice of God, but we must be faithful to the voice of God. Revelation 2 and verse 10, Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. So there's hope for all of us. Doesn't matter what happens here. There's hope for rewards. There's hope for something better. When we will listen to the voice of God, obey His voice, and be faithful to His voice. And so this morning, if there are those here present who have never yet done what needs to be done in listening to God and obeying God, you need to do that this morning. And, and if you're here, someone who has done that, but you haven't been faithful to what God has to say, then you need to correct that tonight or this morning by repenting of your sins and coming back to God. For those who are not with us, but maybe watching this through YouTube or on Facebook, you need to listen to God's voice and obey it too. And if you need help in making your life right with God, our elders are, are ready. And you can contact them at elders at deer, deerfootcsc.com and, and get the help that you need in making your life right with God. But if you're present with us today and you need to respond to it, then we encourage you to do that now while together we stand and while we sing.